This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and Bob is back. Okay, I know, you're thinking, Bob, do you have another one named Sally? No, the original HP Spectre X360 that we reviewed a couple of years ago now was so awesome for its time in terms of the, the features that it offered for the price, 360-degree con convertible, a lot of ports on there, nice display, and even supported a digital pen. So we call it best of the best, or Bob for short. And we smacked it down with so many laptops, I don't think anything other than the XPS 13 has had its share of smackdowns in, in such high numbers. So finally, HP has done a redesign. It's been a couple of years now and, and they've refreshed the this, this Spectre X360 a long way, but this time they shaved off a half a pound of weight. And that's nice because one thing about 360 degree convertibles, they tend to be kind of heavy. So the old one was 3.3 pounds. This one is 2.8 pounds, which makes it as light as the lighter 13.3 inch ultrabooks on the market. It also got a little bit thinner. I mean, it's pretty darn skinny. The old one was actually pretty darn skinny, but even more importantly, it had really big bezels on the side and they reduced those bezels. So about three quarters of an inch or so, a significantly more portable product. And it still does the 360 degree thing and a bunch of other stuff too. But one thing that's gone, and this is really confusing because right now, October, 2016 folks, you're seeing a lot of HP ads on TV for the Spectre, particularly the, the, the one that's in that kind of dusky, smoky, dark gray color that they call ash silver. And they're showing it with the pen and how awesome that is and that Max can't do it. Do you know what? They killed the pen in this. Yes, they did. Good for them, right? So you're all going to be confused. You're going to go to the store and say, give me that pen. You'd have to get the last generation model. This one right here with Intel, KB Lake, seventh generation CPUs, that really nice new design that you do want, doesn't do the pen. So you're back to just a capacitive kind of stylus and that's it. Still, there's a lot of good stuff here. We're going to look at it now. So the HP Spectre X360, well, it comes in a couple of different configurations. And right now, Best Buy has the uh, bricks and mortar retail exclusive on. I'm sure it'll start to appear in other stores as well. And of course, it's on HP's website and you can get uh, even lower end and less expensive configurations. But the configuration that we have is the $1,159 2.7 gigahertz Core i7 7500U. That's a 15 watt dual core Ultrabook CPU with 8 gigs of DDR3 RAM soldered on board. Not upgradable, folks, so get the amount of RAM you need. That's at 8 gigs, it's fine for most people. And you get a 256 gig M2 PCIe NVMe SSD. In our case, it's the Samsung PM951, which has really fast read times, not so fast write times. It's, it's used in a lot of laptops that come with an NVMe SSD. It, it's a pretty good drive, but you, you, you folks who are real psychos for write performance might want to upgrade it to a Samsung 8, 950 Pro or something like that. There's also a 1349 model, and that does get you the 16 gigs of RAM and moves you up to a 512 gig SSD. The SSD is upgradable. If you open up the bottom and remove the Torx T5 screws and two hidden Phillips head screws at the that are under the rubber rear feet. You don't take off the front ones, just the back ones. And then you can take off the bottom cover. And really only the wireless card and the SSD are upgradable. Of course, obviously then you gain access to the battery too. Intel HD 620 graphics. So integrated graphics here. Something in this is in light. Of course, it's going to have integrated graphics. And that's the nice part here where the move to Intel 7th generation CPUs have meant 2 to 3% CPU in performance as Intel continues to focus on improving battery life and reducing heat rather than amping up performance a whole lot. They're all, they have been working on improving integrated graphics performance. And there's a solid 10% improvement over Skylake graphics. And that gives you a little extra punch in Photoshop, makes your casual games run more quickly. It doesn't mean you're going to be playing Battlefield 1 on this. It's not what it's meant for. So as with the last generation Spectre X360, and unlike the Spectre Not 360 that we reviewed, that's super thin and light 13.3 inch, this one has a touch screen, 10 points of touch, no pen support, like I said. Uh, <laughs> I know. It's a bummer, it really is. You can use a capacitive stylus like the ones meant for iPads, like I said, but it goes flat, goes tint mode, it goes presentation mode, you name it. And it has a pretty nice and fluid hinge. Some bounce here if you if you poke at it, you know, which is typical of these kind of products. I really would like to see a little less of that. 
See what I mean? Boing, 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 boing. Okay, that is what it is. For those, I know some of you use these on commutes on the train and you're driven crazy by that kind of thing too because it will just bounce a bit. Other than that, everything about the build quality is impeccable, which was true of the last generation model, but this one looks more modern. The bezels on the side just about non-existent, just about the same size as the Dell XPS 13, the one that started the whole bezel-less craze. Now HP does have a bezel up top still and I'm okay with that because they have the 1080p webcam up here so it's not a chin cam. Anybody who's lived with the XPS 13 and found themselves convoluting and laying their face on the desk to try to actually, you know, show something other than their chin can appreciate it belongs up here. There's also a Windows Hello camera, an infrared camera here that works very well, just like the Surface products have as well. And this is pretty mature technology at this point so it works like really well for logging in. Down here there is a pretty sizable area and it's likely due to the reinforcement also required for something that is a convertible here. So there it is. At least these bezels are small. The top one's not too bad. This one's pretty sizable, but you know, uh, Lenovo Yoga 900S also has a pretty tall, even taller in fact, bottom bezel area. This prettiness over here is ventilation and speakers both. We have four speakers, two on the underside and here and here, Bang & Olufsen Audio, as it says right there. Pretty good sounding audio, actually, for a 13-inch Ultrabook. Uh, bass is still not wow, but Bang & Olufsen Control Panel does give you access to an EQ where you can even further improve things. It's nice enough. There's actually two fans in this, which is unusual for something that doesn't have dedicated graphics. Usually it's just one fan. So you have one that's over here, and it's located over the heat sink over the CPU and exhausts air out on the left side where there's a vent that I'll show you. And there's another little fan over here, which I assume is an air intake to try to increase airflow, which this needs because if you're pushing it really hard, it runs hot. If you're doing productivity work, if you're surfing the web, even if you're doing some Photoshop work, you won't even hear the fans. It'll get warm in this area and in the corresponding area on the underside, it's, it's just not going to get burning hot. But playing Civ 6, which I'm going to show you, that, which is about one of the best ways to heat up an Ultrabook, it does get pretty hot, so it does need the cooling. So if we look at the sides on this, the same beautiful polished aluminum edges here, no rough spots, no seams, no nothing. And there are magnets here. This, on the underside, the magnets were strong enough to actually pick up some paper clips on my desk and take it with with it. It was kind of kind of funny. I looked at the bottom and I said, wow, look at that, four paper clips. Just just what I needed. Screws that hold it the bottom on. You can see them there. And this is where you have to peel off the two rubber feet. You need a fingernail or somebody you know who has a fingernail to gently pry those off so you can get the two Phillips head screws. Let's hear from mixing up screw types. Thanks HP. Here's your bottom speakers. On the back, the same kind of double barrel look, which even the uh, ThinkPad X1 Yoga now has actually copied. Beautiful looking as ever, a little bit of visual contrast here with the shiny polished lines. It's a nice looking machine. You got a little Spectre back here. All in all, well done. As ever with convertibles, there are controls on the outside. You have your regular top multimedia row for volume control, but you also have it here in case you're using it in tablet mode. And looky, looky, better than a cookie. It is two USB-C Gen 2 slash also Thunderbolt 3 ports. So this is a forward-looking product. And with two ports, because one of them is going to be used by the included charger, you still have another connection available, even when you are plugged into power. And I found it compatible with all the stuff that we currently have in-house, USB-C, third-party USB-C chargers, uh, docks, that sort of thing. It's behaved nicely. I don't know if it's going to support the Razer Core. So far, HP has been disabling external graphics amplifiers in firmware. Don't know why that is and a regular USB-C port over here. So you have a legacy port too. You're not going to have to run to the store and buy some kind of dongle adapter just to plug in your USB hub or peripherals. Headphone jack over here, and that is the power button, which you press and hold to turn it on. So even though it's on the side, it's not easy to activate accidentally. So with the last generation Spectre, as it evolved, HP did all sorts of different things. That ash silver for the dusky brownish, bronzy brownie, silvery all at once kind of look. They had 2K display models. They had an OLED model not too long ago. With this one right now, we're just looking at a 1920 by 1080 display option. Very nice panel. We'll get to the display. And the 
basic silver color. So that means we're going back to that problem where there's not a lot of contrast between the key masking and the light silver keys. This may be a little bit darker here, but it's not absolute black because the backlighting has to shine through here. So there's still that kind of twilight zone of, of twilight lighting, literally where you're in a place that's dimly lit, but not dark enough where you'd want to turn on the keyboard backlighting where it becomes hard to see the keys here. So that problem still exists. It does have backlighting, and in most cases, I turn that on and it actually fixes the problem. That's why I think they've improved things a little bit. It's And this backlighting key that used to have a annoying light that was on all the time to let you know, that's gone. There's nobody ever liked that, but it's single stage backlighting, so it's either on or it's off. The keyboard itself, 1.3 millimeters of key travel that actually went down, that's usually a bad thing. That's the same key travel as on the Dell XPS 13. And I've never absolutely loved that keyboard, mostly because when you hit the bottom of the stroke, it really feels kind of harsh. They did something wonderful with this keyboard. And even though the travel is short on this, I love typing on this. And I type a lot of long reviews on this. I like the keyboard better even than the previous generation Spectre, honestly. That one was fine. It was, it didn't send me in fits of love and joy, but I, I certainly didn't dislike it. It was adequate. It was fine. This one is nice. We still have the oversized trackpad here. HP likes big trackpads. I don't think it's quite as exaggeratedly long as some of their previous models. You can't really fit an iPhone on top of it anymore the way you could with some of them. Synaptics trackpad, obvious single piece, so the clickers are underneath, and it works just fine. It tracks very well. It's a fairly fast glass surface, not as fast as the Asus ZenBook 3 that we reviewed that's like skating on ice almost in comparison. It's a good trackpad. I have no issues with it. I've found it quite enjoyable to use. HP Spectres have really nice displays. This is no exception. In fact, th there have always been IPS, but I think the viewing angles are a little bit better on this one than on the previous generation. Tilting forward, tilting backward, you still get a very bright view. Like I said, 1920 by 1080 full HD. That's currently your only display resolution option. I'm sure HP is going to add a 2K model later, just like they did with the previous Spectres. Bonded glass here, so reflections are reduced somewhat, thankfully, because the last gen Spectre was really a mirror. In terms of color gamut, it's right up there with other top laptops. You got full sRGB coverage and 74% of Adobe RGB. And it's calibrated pretty well out of the box, so we did see some improvement. It was a little too blue-green from the factory with, with using our hardware colorimeter to calibrate it. 330 nits of brightness, that's quite bright, though I find that Intel's power management on this means that when you're running on battery power, it, it will automatically drop down that brightness some, so you may have to twiddle with your settings if you want it really bright when you're running on battery power. Black levels are good at 0.41 at max brightness, and the contrast ratio works out to 800 to 1, which is a bit better than an average for what we've seen even for laptops in this price range. It's really a very pleasing looking display. I don't think it has quite the pop and dynamic range of that Asus ZenBook 3 that we reviewed recently, but that one's not a touch screen and it's not a convertible, so there's that. Gamma's almost perfect at 2.3 and the, the hardware white point is 6,700 degrees Kelvin, very close to the ideal 65 to 6,600, which is admirable because most laptops are 7,000 or above these days, which is much too cool white. So for those of you who actually work in content production, you know that you don't want to have your whites leaning toward the blue. So in terms of performance, once again, 15-watt dual-core Ultrabook Core i7, 7th generation KB Lake in here. 2.7 gigahertz, that's pretty fast stuff as Ultrabooks go. I mean, it's not a quad-core gaming laptop, sure, but for everyday laptops, this is on the fast side. And you can see this is our Crystal Disk Mark score for the factory SSD. Notice the very fast read times here. The, the write times are decent, but they're not as stellar as a super expensive SSD. But, you know, for most of us, I think this is perfectly adequate stuff. Graphics performance is going to be the biggest boost here, and that's why our PC Mark Eight score is so healthy here because it takes that into account for the home accelerated tests that we run. For regular CPU intensive tests like Geekbench and W Prime, the difference between this and Skylake will be smaller, and we'll throw up the benchmark graph so you can see it. You have come far. Now begins your greatest quest. From this early cradle of civ so that's Civ launching, and you can hear how good those speakers sound. That's pretty nice audio for a 13-inch laptop. 
And sure, it can do Photoshop, no problem, and be very enjoyable. Even if you're a professional photo editor, it can do Excel and large spreadsheets, all that sort of thing. But something even more demanding is the new Civ 6 that we have running here. Now, I've also played this on the Asus Rogue GL502, a quad-core gaming laptop with NVIDIA GTX 1070 graphics. And I can tell you, in terms of responsiveness for turn times, which is really the thing because the CPU is what's working hard here, not much of a difference, actually. Either way, you're going to be waiting, in other words. And this does support touch, too, so we can do stuff with touch, which is nice. Your pinch zooming and all that sort of thing. That's one of the things that's nice about this. This is one of the few kind of serious games that you can actually play on Ultrabook and make use of touch. Of course, there are casual games as well for that. Now, like I said, running Civ is going to be the way to get this laptop, any laptop, Ultrabook, hot as possible. And this does get pretty darn hot. And it will show you using our, our FLIR thermal sensor imaging camera just how hot it gets and it's it's the areas at least that are away from you it's the top vent area and the corresponding area directly below the cpu temperatures are not alarmingly hot we didn't see the cpu go above 65 degrees centigrade so i'm not worried about the health of the laptop there but that's the price we pay with these thin and light metal designs and not to worry, there's a big difference between playing Civ 6 and using Photoshop or streaming Netflix or any of those things. Uh, under no other case did we see the laptop get that hot in terms of thermal readings. Usually it was around human body temperature to about a 105 degrees Fahrenheit at the hottest, which isn't alarming. It will feel warm to the touch, but that's about it. And the trackpad stays cool in the front area where you're going to be touching it the most. Battery in this is 58 watt hours, actually 57.8 to be precise, which is a pretty high capacity battery for a 13.3 inch thin and light Ultrabook. As you might expect, that means good battery life. Now, not the 14 hours that HP claims. I wish they would stop, like so many old guard PC makers, having these wild claims where if you ran at zero brightness and had wireless off and ran no programs, yes, maybe it would. But in real life, it's good for about eight hours, which is still really very impressive, especially given the fact we got a Core i7 in here and ample amount of RAM and an SSD and all that good stuff and a very bright display too. Now, when we run those tests, we do productivity and streaming video work, some Photoshop editing, and we keep the brightness at about 150 nits. So that varies as a percentage point between laptops. But in the case of this one, given that it ramps up to being very bright at the very end of the brightness setting increases, that means at about 40% brightness in terms of your percentage settings. Ships with the charger here that's very compact and light. This is a total MacBook Pro kind of clone charger, isn't it, and MacBook Air. And ample cord, and it's one of those ooh, nice soft rubber kind of feeling cords there to give you that classy thing. And just like the MacBook here, you've got this separate little piece. So if you don't need all this cord length, you can pull this off and pop this on here. And it has your little prongs. So you can roll either way. Of course, the HP Spectre X360 doesn't exist in a vacuum. When it first came out, it actually, well, it wasn't a vacuum, but it was one of the few, relatively speaking, super classy looking thin and light convertibles. Now there's plenty of convertibles on the market. Some of them are fairly classy. Uh, the XPS line obviously is not a convertible, so it doesn't really compete in the same way. No 360-degree hinge. But Dell's Inspiron does, and this is the Inspiron 7000, which is the highest end of the Inspiron 13 line. And this one sells for around $750 or so. Difference in uh, looks. I mean, both of these are metal. The Dell is obviously a lot thicker, not nearly as pretty, machined, and frou-frou looking. I mean, if you look at HP's website, they're making a big deal of their design and almost as a lifestyle product that looks great in your living room sort of thing. The Dell is a little bit more workmanlike. But that said, the Dell has more legacy ports on board. For those of you who are not down with switching over to Thunderbolt 3 and you want to have your legacy ports. And for those of you who are more business minded, there's of course the lovely, at least if you're into the ThinkPad look, ThinkPad X1 Yoga. This is the one with the 360 degree hinge and it does have the Wacom AES pen with a little pen in the silo. So if you must have the pen, worth a look. This is even available with an OLED display. It's a 14 inch laptop so it's going to have a bigger footprint but it's also very skinny and interestingly enough they kind of sort of copied HP's double rounded hinge action going on on the back. This has standard security features like a fingerprint scanner versus the Windows Hello facial recognition. So I leave that up to you as to which kind of authentication you feel you need. 
And lastly, you know, they really are kind of in a different category, but if you're looking for something that has real flashy, good looks, is super thin and light and all that sort of thing, I suppose you could be considering both of these. The ASUS ZenBook 3 that we just did a review of, 12 and a half inch display. This is a two pounder, so it's in a different category, non-convertible, non-touch screen, but Intel Cabby Lake inside, Core i5 and i7 CPU. So you're looking at the same horsepower, but I would say that you can see how much HP has decreased the footprint that compared to a 12 and a half inch standard laptop design, it's not really all that much bigger, which is pretty impressive. And of course, because the, the ASUS goes after the 12 inch MacBook crowd here, we are port constrained. This has just one USB-C Gen 1 port. So if you think that HP doesn't have a lot of ports, well, the ASUS is even more port constrained. It's really meant to be your on the go second laptop, whereas the HP is still designed to be your primary laptop. So that's the HP Spectre X360 Late 2016 Edition with Intel 7th Generation KB Lake. Not to be confused with previous generations. A lot lighter, a lot smaller, really as petite as any ultrabooky, <laughs> seriously small, thin and light ultrabook. And it's a convertible, so that's pretty impressive because, you know, the hinge and all that sort of thing that's required to make these things do exactly this has usually a significant weight and size. So. It's a really great looking product, unless you're looking for an active digitizer with a, you know, a Wacom pen or a Synaptics pen like this used to have, any of that kind of thing, you're not going to get it here. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos. And hey, if you like this video, 